A Course in Miracles, Urtext Manuscripts, Complete 7 Volume Combined Edition, Volume 3, Manual for Teachers, Section 1, Introduction. The role of teaching and learning is actually reversed in the thinking of the world. The reversal is characteristic. It seems as if the teacher and the learner are separated. The teacher giving something to the learner rather than to himself. Further, the act of teaching is regarded as a special activity in which one engages only a small, relatively small proportion of one's time. The course, on the other hand, emphasizes that to teach is to learn, so that teacher and learner are the same. It also emphasizes that teaching is a constant process. It goes on every moment of the day and continues into sleeping thoughts as well. To teach is to demonstrate. There are only two thought systems and you demonstrate that you believe one or the other is true all the time. From your demonstration, others learn and so do you. The question is not whether you will teach, for in that there is no choice. The purpose of the course might be set to provide you with a means of choosing what you want to teach on the basis of what you want to learn. You cannot give to someone else, and this you learn through teaching. Teaching is but a call to witnesses to attest to what you believe. It is a method of conversion. This is not done by words alone. Any situation must be to you a chance to teach others what you are and what they are to you. No more than that, but also never less. The curriculum that you set up is therefore determined exclusively by what you think you are and what you believe the relationship of others is to you. In the formal teaching situations, these questions may be totally unrelated to what you think you are teaching. Yet it is impossible not to use the content of any situation on behalf of what you really teach and therefore learn. To this, the verbal content of your teaching is quite irrelevant. It may coincide with it or it may not. It is the teaching underlying what you say that teaches you. Teaching but reinforces what you believe about yourself. Its fundamental purpose is to diminish self-doubt. This does not mean that the self you are trying to protect is real, but it does mean that the self you think is real is what you teach. This is inevitable. There is no escape from it. How could it be otherwise? Everyone who follows the world's curriculum, and everyone here does follow it until he changes his mind, teaches solely to convince himself that he is what he is not. Herein is the purpose of the world. What else, then, would its curriculum be? Into this hopeless and closed learning situation, which teaches nothing but despair and death, God sends his teachers. And as they teach his lessons of joy and hope, their learning finally becomes complete. Except for God's teachers, there would be no hope of salvation, for the world of sin would be forever real. The self-deceiving must deceive, for they must teach deception. And what else is hell? This is a manual for the teachers of God. They are not perfect or they would not be here. Yet it is their mission to become perfect here, and so they teach perfection over and over in many ways until they have learned it. And then they are seen no more, although their thoughts remain a source of strength and truth forever. Who are they? How are they chosen? What do they do? How can they work out their own salvation and the salvation of the world? This manual attempts to answer these questions. Section 2. Who are God's teachers? A teacher of God is anyone who chooses to be one. His qualifications consist solely in this. Somehow, somewhere, 
he has made a deliberate choice in which he did not see his interests as apart from someone else's. Once he has done that, his road is established and his direction is sure. A light has entered the darkness. It may be a single light, but that is enough. He has entered an agreement with God, even if he does not yet believe in him. He has become a bringer of salvation. He has become a teacher of God. They come from all over the world. They come from all religions and from no religion. They are the ones who have answered. The call is universal. It goes on all the time, everywhere. It calls for teachers to speak for it and redeem the world. Many hear it, but few will answer. But it is all a matter of time. Everyone will answer in the end, but the end can be a long, long way off. It is because of this that the plan of the teachers was established. Their function is to save time. Each one begins as a single light, but with the call at its center, it is a light that cannot be limited, and each one saves a thousand years of time as the world judges it. To the call itself, time has no meaning. There's a course for every teacher of God. The form of the course varies greatly. So do the particular teaching aids involved. But the content of the course never changes. Its central theme is always God's Son is guiltless and in His innocence is His salvation. It can be taught by actions or thoughts, in words or soundlessly, in any language or in no language, in any place or time or manner. It does not matter who the teacher was before he heard the call. He has become a savior by his answering. He has seen someone else as himself. He has therefore found his own salvation and the salvation of the world. In his rebirth is the world reborn. This is a manual for a special curriculum, intended for teachers of a special form of the universal course. There are many thousands of other forms, all with the same outcome. They merely save time. Yet it is time alone that winds on wearily, and the world is very tired now. It is old and worn and without hope. There was never a question of outcome. For what can change the will of God? But time, with its illusions of change and death, wears out the world and all things in it. Yet time has an ending. And it is this that the teachers of God are appointed to bring about. For time is in their hands. Such was their choice. And it is given them. Section 3. Who are their pupils? Certain pupils have been assigned to each of the God's teachers, and they will begin to look for him as soon as he has answered the call. They were chosen for him because the form of the universal curriculum that he will teach is best for them in view of their level of understanding. His pupils have actually been waiting for him, for his coming is certain. Again, it is only a matter of time. Once he has chosen to fulfill his role, they are ready to fulfill theirs. Time waits on his choice, but not whom he will serve. When he is ready to learn, the opportunities to teach will be provided for him. In order to understand the teaching learning plan of salvation, it is necessary to grasp the concept of time which this course sets forth. Atonement corrects illusions not truth. Therefore it corrects what never was. Further, the plan for this correction was established and completed simultaneously, for the will of God is entirely apart from time. So is all reality being of him. The instant the idea of separation entered the mind of God's Son, in that same instant was God's answer given. In time, his, this happened very long ago. In reality, it never happened at all. The world of time is the world of illusion. 
What happened long ago seems to be happening now. Choices made long since appear to be open yet to be made. What has been learned and understood and long ago passed by is looked upon as a new thought, a fresh idea, a different approach. But your will is free. You can accept what has already happened at any time you choose. And only then will you realize that it was always there. As the course emphasizes, you are not free to choose the curriculum or even the form in which you will learn it. You are free, however, to decide when you want to learn it. And as you accept it, it is already learned. Time really then goes backward to an instant so ancient that it is beyond all memory and past even the possibility of remembering. Yet because it is an instant that is relived again and again and still again, it seems to be now. And thus it is that pupil and teacher seem to come together in the present, finding each other as if they had not met before. The pupil comes at the right time to the right place. This is inevitable because he made the right choice in that ancient instant which he now relives. So as the teacher, too, made an inevitable choice out of an ancient past. God's will in everything but seems to take time in the working out. What could delay the power of eternity? When pupil and teacher come together, a teaching-learning situation begins, for the teacher is not really the one who does the teaching. God's teachers speak to any two who join together for learning purposes. The relationship is holy because of that purpose, and God has promised to send His Spirit into any holy relationship. In the teaching-learning situation, each one learns that giving and receiving are the same. The demarcations they have drawn between their roles, their minds, their bodies, their needs, their interests, and all the differences they thought separated them from one another, fade and grow dim and disappear. Those who would learn the same course share one interest and one goal, and thus he who was the learner becomes a teacher of God himself, for he has made the one decision that gave his teacher to him. He has seen in another person the same interests as his own. Section 4. What are the levels of teaching? The teachers of God have no set teaching level. Each teaching learning situation involves a different relationship at the beginning. Although the ultimate goal is always the same, to make of the relationship a holy relationship, in which both can look upon the Son of God as sinless, there is no one from whom a teacher of God cannot learn, so there is no one whom he cannot teach. However, from a practical point of view, he cannot meet everyone, nor everyone find him. Therefore, the plan includes very specific contacts to be made for each teacher of God. There are no accidents in salvation. Those who are to meet will meet because together they have the potential for a holy relationship. They are ready for each other. The simplest level of teaching appears to be quite superficial. It consists of what seems to be very casual encounters, a chance meeting of two apparent strangers in an elevator, a child who is not looking where he's going, running into an adult by accident, two students who happen to walk home together. These are not chance encounters. Each of them has the potential for becoming a teaching-learning situation. Perhaps the seeming stranger in the elevator will smile to one another. Perhaps the man will not scold the child for bumping into him. Perhaps the student will become friends. Even at the level of the most casual encounter, it is possible for two people to lose sight of separate interests, if only for a moment. That moment will be enough. Salvation has come. 
It is difficult to understand at levels of teaching the universal course is a concept as meaningless in reality as is time. The illusion of one permits the illusion of the other. In time, the teacher of God seems to begin to change his mind about the world with a single decision and then learns more and more about the new direction as he teaches it. We have covered the illusion of time already, but the illusion of levels of teaching seems to be something different. Perhaps the best way to demonstrate that these levels cannot exist is simply to say that any level of the teaching learning situation is part of God's plan for atonement, and his plan can have no levels being the reflection of his will. Salvation is always ready and always there. God's teachers work at different levels, but the result is always the same. Each teaching learning situation is maximal in the sense that each person involved will learn the most that he can from the other person at that time. In this sense, and in this sense only, we can speak of levels of teaching. Using the term in this way, the second level of teaching is more sustained relationship in which for a time two people enter into a fairly intense teaching learning situation and then appear to separate. As with the first level, these meetings are not accidental, nor is what appears to be at the end of the relationship a real end. Again, each has learned the most he can at the time. Yet all who meet will someday meet again, for it is the destiny of all relationships to become holy. God is not mistaken in his Son. The third level of teaching occurs in relationships which, once they are formed, are lifelong. These are teaching learning situations in which each person is given a chosen learning partner who presents him with unlimited opportunities for learning. These relationships are generally few because their existence implies that those involved have reached a stage simultaneously in which the teaching-learning balance is actually perfect. This does not mean that they necessarily recognize this. In fact, they generally do not. They may even be quite hostile to each other for some time and perhaps for life. Yet, should they decide to learn it, the perfect lesson is before them and can be learned. And if they decide to learn that lesson, they become the saviors of the teachers who falter and may even seem to fail. No teacher of God can fail to find the help he needs.